Thank you so much. I want to commend you for the incredible way you ministered to people last night as believers. It was absolutely powerful to walk among you. Look at your neighbor and say to them, you are powerful. Look back and say, in Jesus. Look back and say, so let's demonstrate it today. Yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, as I'm, I'm sure most of you know, Isaiah was a brilliant court preacher. He had more messianic ship insight to this Jesus than any of the prophets. So in chapter 52, in verse 6, he said, Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doeth, that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Then in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, In verse 18, the Bible says here, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. If you look at verse 21, the angel announced, And she shall bring forth a son, And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. At the end of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, And these signs, in verse 17, chapter 16, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. What is his name? Say it again. Jesus. In my name, Jesus, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name, he said. And then... In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10, the revelation, the understanding was, Philippians 2.10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and that are under the earth. I want to entitle this today, The Ultimate Understanding. Would you lift your hands, your voices, and your hearts, and would you pray that that understanding will come to you, and that the anointing of revelation and understanding will permeate your very being, heart, mind, and soul. Lord Jesus, today, we have extended our hands lifted them into your presence, called upon your name, worshipped in your presence. We feel the brush of angels' wings in this sanctuary today. O Lord Jesus, Master of the universe, wrap your arms of love around us. Lift us into the realm of understanding, demonstration, the anointing of the Holy One from Israel. We will not fail to give you praise, glory, and honor. We ask things in your matchless, all-powerful name, even the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And everyone said, Amen. Lord bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing so long.
if you have any energy left at all, would you clap one more time and would you let your voice out? Jesus, speaking to a Jewish audience, was accurate when he said, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Because the Jews did not know his name. They only dealt with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through terms of relationship as they knew him by his relationship with them. They referred to him as Elohim. They also referred to him as Adonai, which means Lord. They also called him El Shaddai. They also referred to him as Shalom. They also referred to him as I Am. And then they referred to him as Hashem. Hashem in Hebrew means the name. They simply called him the name, but they didn't know what that name was. Even in present hour, among the Jews in orthodoxy, they do not refer to God as they speak of him in any other manner, basically, except to say Hashem said. Everything is Hashem. Everything is the name, but they do not know the name the name of Jesus is literally, from the Hebrew, is Yahashua. Yahashua means God has become our salvation. I have visited a number of magnificent Jewish temples in our area, and most of them have beautiful stained glass windows way up high in the auditorium. And I can read enough Hebrew that I always am able to spot. There's always one at the very top, the Hebrew letters in magnificent stained glass. And it says in Hebrew, Yahashua. And I ask the rabbis, I say, what does that say? I know what it says, but I want to see what they will say. And they always say to me, it's the unpronounceable name of God. We cannot pronounce it. I look at them and say, it says Yahashua, doesn't it? And they'll say, yes. I don't know how you feel about it, but I know how I feel about it. I thank God that I'm not calling him the name. I know the name. The name is Jesus. I am here today to defend that name, to exalt that name, to worship that name. To cry that name. Because I don't care, ladies and gentlemen, how you say it. You can weep that name. You can whisper that name. You can shout that name. You can moan that name. You can groan that name. You can whisper that name. You can laugh that name. You can cry that name. But in any stance, any position, it works! Ah. So clap your hands, all ye people, and shout, whisper, cry, the name of Jesus. Oh. The disciples had a great power. They had a power to which we are utterly strangers, basically. They knew that to pray in Jesus' name was as though Jesus himself was doing the praying. They took his place on earth. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Literally interpreted, that means. And these signs shall follow the believing ones. He is with us 
in the power and authority of his name. Now, if language means anything, then Jesus gave the church the power of attorney. We have the legal right to use his name. The value of power of attorney depends upon how much power and authority are back of that name. So for your enlightenment, revelation, understanding, there is no name that can compare with his name. It is the ultimate. Say it again. You can feel the air tremble when you mention his name. When you shout it, it has a terrific effect upon the spirit world around us. Jesus inherited a more excellent name than any of the angels as the first begotten son or body of God. Wherever you see the word son in the New Testament, you can temporarily lift it out and replace it with the word body. The body of Jesus is the only body God has ever had. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten body. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is a spirit. You can't see him. But he became a body for the likes of us. <laughs> Jesus was a name before which every knee should bow in the three worlds. Heaven, earth, and hell. By his conquest over sin... Satan, disease, death, hell and the grave, he acquired a name above all names. He acquired it. So Jesus is giving us a signed check on the resources of heaven and asking us to fill it in. We have the right to use that name against our enemies. We have the right to use it in our petitions. We have the right to use it in prayer and praise and worship. That name has been given to us and Jesus is the mighty victor through death and resurrection. Jesus, I love to think about this. Jesus through death paralyzed him that had dominion of death, the devil. When Jesus rose from the dead, he not only had the keys of death and hell, but he had the very armor in which Satan trusted. This Jesus, when he cried on the cross, it is finished. As far as I'm concerned, he should have cried even louder and said, it is beginning. Because the devil, when Jesus, his body slumped in death on that cross, the devil thought it was over. No, no, no. It's only beginning, Lucifer. Because you're not going to have just one Jesus now. There's going to be 3,000. Then there's going to be 5,000 that are going to do exactly what he did. They're going to cast you out. They're going to raise the dead. They're going to cause healing to come. They're going to be filled with the Spirit. Clap your hands again and rejoice in the presence of this resurrected one whose name is Jesus. And I believe and know with all of my heart that when that body died upon the cross, not the Spirit of God, but the body that housed the Spirit of God, when it just slumped in death, the Spirit of God... I believe with all of my heart did something that I rejoice over 
in, in, at odd times, at good times, in bad times. And that's this. I believe that when Jesus cried, it's finished, and his body slumped in death. I believe Lucifer was, was there watching that. He had fought him from his birth all the way through the crucifixion. He fought him through Pharisees, Sadducees, the priest. He fought him through the Romans. He fought him through every channel he could, he could, he could use. Do you understand something here today? The devil has no influence of his own. He borrows his influence from people. He didn't kill the prophets. He got people to do that. He didn't crucify Jesus. He got people to do that. He didn't kill the apostles. He got people to do that. He doesn't fight you. He can't kill you. He'll get people to do it. He has no influence of his own at all. But he thought he did. So, when he felt Jesus was dead... I believe that he went to the four corners of the earth, the four winds of the earth. And I believe he called all of the demonic forces together, all of his cohorts together, and said, he's dead. The one that cast us into the gutter, he is now dead. And we're going to have a celebration. And I believe there was a celebration going on in the very pits of hell, or wherever he gathered his devils to the celebration. But right in the middle of the celebration, there was a knock at the gates of hell. And the emissary posted there said, Who is it? And the answer came back and said, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Open to me the gates. I believe that emissary left the post and ran straight into Lucifer's throne room. And I think he made an announcement like this. Lucifer, I'm sorry, Master, but there's someone knocking at the gate. I'm sorry to interrupt this celebration. And I think Lucifer said, who is it? And the emissary said, he said, his name is Jesus of Nazareth. You talk about bringing a party to a screeching halt. I mean, the party came to a screeching halt. And Lucifer said, you'll have to let him in. And that emissary went back to the gates of hell and opened the gates. And Jesus stepped through, turned his back on that emissary and walked down into that place. And when Jesus walked into the very throne room of Lucifer, he reached out a nail scarred hand. And he said, Lucifer, give them to me. Give them to me, the keys of death and hell. And I believe that Lucifer reached into his robe, if he wears one, and pulled out the keys of death and hell and surrendered them into a nail-scarred hand. <laughs> Jesus! Jesus clasped those keys turned his back on Lucifer and walked up out of there. But when he got to the gates of hell, I believe he turned and looked back into that place and said, Lucifer, in the future, my church will be knocking at the gates of hell and you must open because it is written, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. <laughs> Clap your hands, all ye people.
So what I'm saying here today is this. Gates don't move any place. We should be storming the gates of hell. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We ought to be going to the gates of hell and say, Lucifer, I command, let my mother go. Let my father go. Let my son go. Let my daughter go. Let my neighbor go. Let because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I feel like screaming. I feel like shouting. I feel like dancing. So one more time, clap your hands. Do whatever you feel to do for a moment. But let us rejoice. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice. Because it's time for the rejoicing. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We are the church. We are the church. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Jesus stands before the three worlds, I reiterate. Heaven, earth, hell. As the undisputed victor over man's ancient enemy and destroyer. This Jesus stands as the master of the universe. All he was is in that name. All that is today is in that name, and that name is ours. The most staggering statement, in my estimation, that ever fell from the lips of the man from Galilee was that we are to have the use of his name. So, what is mine... I do not need faith to use. I have it. If you've been baptized by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to have any faith to use it. You have it. First John 4.17 makes an exciting, unusual statement. Quote, As he is, so are we in this world. Do you have any idea what a terrifying statement that is to Lucifer? He's afraid of you. The most backslidden person here today, whoever that might be, down on your knees, saying, Jesus strikes terror in his very being. So backslidden or prayed through, try it just once. Say it. I'm sure I've expressed this here before. But I feel to do it again. 
Have you ever seen these kids that walk up and kick someone in the shins for no reason at all? I hate kids like that. <laughs> so do you. You don't say it. I do. I hate kids like that, but I've got their spirit. There's something in me that wants to walk up and just kick the devil in the shins for no reason at all. I just want to just kick him and kick him because I am a tormentor of the devil. I'm a tormentor. I want to torment him. People, every time you come to church, you torment the devil. Brother Smith, every time you preach the way you do, he's having a nervous breakdown. Every time you lift your hands, you're tormenting the devil. Every time you sing, you're tormenting the devil. Every time you dance, you're tormenting the devil. Every time you run around, you're tormenting the devil. Every time we preach the gospel, every time you sing, you are tormenting the devil. In other words, this sanctuary is a torture chamber for Lucifer. It is a torture chamber for him. So why don't you clap like you've never clapped? Why don't you worship like you've never worshipped? Why don't you sing like you've never sung? But I've come to grips with something. We must learn the secret of living in that name. If our minds could only grasp the fact that Satan is paralyzed, stripped of his armor by Jesus, and that disease and sickness are the servants of this Jesus, that at his voice they must depart, it would be easy for us to live and operate in an apostolic realm. A Roman soldier, centurion, Matthew chapter 8. He came to Jesus. Jesus said, I'll go home with you. The centurion looked at him and said, no, no, master. I am set over this hundred men or that hundred men so that you have been set, as you have been set over diseases, you don't have to come to my home, master. Just speak the word. Jesus said, I have not found so great a faith in all of Israel. That centurion had risen to a higher plane of spiritual appreciation of Jesus than most believers enjoy today. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not only are we saved by the name, but we are baptized into the name. And the early church, as I've studied it, did something that is not forcefully carried out among us. They acted for Jesus in his stead. The early Christians were taught that when they gathered together, they did it about and around that name of Jesus. That name was the center around which everything revolved. Their prayers were addressed in that name. In that name, the sick were healed. In that name, demons were cast out. In that name, the Holy Ghost came. In that name, they worshipped. All the work of the early church was wrought in that name. In Colossians 3.17, they were taught to do all things in that name. In Ephesians 5.20, they gave thanks always for all things in that name. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, they were washed, sanctified, justified in that name. Amen. Say it again. In Hebrews 13, 15, they made confession to his name. James 5 and 14, they anointed the sick in that name. We have been given a deed. How few of us really know, possess, or enjoy what our deed covers. I'm convinced if I can find it in the book, I've got a right to practice it. If I can find it in that book, 
That's, that's the thing. That's what makes me what I am. I saw it in the book. If they can do it, I can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. If you can do it, I can do it. You can do it. We can do it. We are the church. We are the church. <laughs> Jesus. Peter. The layman at the gate, beautiful Peter, knew he was acting in Jesus' stead. He had seen Jesus do this. Now he used that same authority. You will notice Peter does not stop and pray for a sick man. He simply says, such as I have, give I unto thee. Rise and walk. He remembered what Jesus had said. Whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it for you. They didn't argue about it. They didn't worry about it. They didn't analyze it. They simply entered into that right with the simplicity of a child. We have been baptized into that name publicly. We are in Jesus. And being in that name, we act representatively of him legally. Consider something. His birth was a miracle. His life was a miracle. His wisdom and teaching were miraculous. He lived and walked in the realm of the miraculous. He made miracles common. There are a few miracles listed in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament with this man called Jesus, they were wholesale. They were everywhere. He made miracles common. His death was a miracle. His resurrection was a miracle. His ascension was a staggering miracle. But perhaps the most outstanding miracle of all those days was the event of Pentecost. Because suddenly, suddenly, the great fulfillment was accomplished by God himself. He never wanted to sit on the lid of a golden box in some tabernacle that he had designed and gave Moses the instruction for. He never wanted to sit on top of a mountain Sinai. He wasn't interested in that. He wanted to get into the tabernacle he had built for himself. And suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared cloven tongues of fire upon their heads. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. It wasn't a mountain shaking. It was human flesh shaking with the power, with the joy, with the presentation of a living God. That's where he wanted to go. That's where he always wanted to go. Inside you. Inside me. So now he's got my mouthpiece. He's got my hands. He's got my feet. He's got my voice. Clap again. Clap again. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Peter was a trembling, fearful, denying man before Pentecost in the upper room. He stumbled out of that upper room, speaking with tongues. From that point on, he fearlessly faced the Sanhedrin, the high priest, with a power that shook everything. A stream of miracles flowed from the hands of the apostles that upset Judaism and shook the Roman Empire to its foundations. In fact, I have listened to professors from Harvard and Yale in the theological departments that admit it was Christianity that destroyed the Roman Empire. When you study the tyranny of the Roman Empire, I watched a documentary that I was able to secure on film, and they say the Roman Empire, from its Conception until it was crushed lasted for 1,000 years. I never realized it was that lengthy in its building and its peak of climax until it was crushed. But in spite of the lions, in spite of the walls, the fire, the Colosseums, the circuses, 
these Christians, in spite of the crucifixions, in spite of the tyranny, the ruthlessness of the Roman Empire, these professors admit it was Christianity that toppled the Roman Empire because the fire couldn't burn it and the lions couldn't eat it and the walls couldn't hold it. It was like a forest fire out of control. You know what my prayer is in these last days? Is that same power, that same power of the church will rise on the horizon and absolutely wipe out the isms and the schisms and the power of God will absolutely sweep through this world as we've heard preached here until leaders, kings, authorities are forced to admit this Jesus is alive and that he is the supreme king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and of his kingdom there shall never be an end. He is, he was, and he shall be always, always, always. His name has been given to us. Man is the offspring of this miracle worker. Christianity is based on a series of miracles culminating at Pentecost, and it must not die. It must not die. Apostolic Christianity is the life of God in man. That's what it is. And wherever there rises a man or woman whose prayers are heard and answered, multitudes flock to them. Do you ever notice something? John the Baptist never went to Jerusalem. Jerusalem came to John the Baptist. God is raising up among us right now. We've heard some of the voices in this meeting. God is raising up John the Baptist ministries right now all over our movement. Where crowds are thronging to hear what thus saith the Lord. People want to get where the move of God is. People are sick of religion. I'm sick of religion. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of church. I'm sick of meetings. I'm sick of meetings. I'm sick of camp. I'm sick of it all. Unless when I get there, Jesus is going to show up. If he shows up, miracles will happen. Signs and wonders will happen. People will be converted from the error of their way. We, people, I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm speaking on behalf of every pastor I've ever preached for and been one myself. We cannot afford to have one bad service. Something has got to happen. Our people are facing things out there that are unimaginable. They can't just come to church and go through some little routine. Something has got to happen where two or three are gathered together in his name. There he is in the midst of them. Something has got to happen. There's got to be a deliverance for our people. We've got to have a move of God every time we come to church. We've got to have a move of God every time we come to church. We cannot afford to have one bad service. The deep-seated hunger in the human heart for God is the reason for all religions. If man cannot find the true God, he'll create one with his own hands and then fall down and worship it. I've watched them do it. Men are easily deceived by pseudo-miracle workers because of this hunger for the supernatural. If we take the supernatural out of this gospel, we have only another religion. That's all we have. You're never going to reach this world with religion. You're not going to reach the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims with religion. They've got more religion than we'll ever have. It's coming out of their ears. But what they don't have is a living God that can cause blind eyes to open, can take leprosy out of the skin, can cause legs to grow, cancer to disappear. They don't have that. 
I've had Muslims come to services where I've been in the last few years, and they've said the same thing. I've served all, all of my life and never felt God once, but in this place, I feel God. <laughs> you know all about that, Brother Scott. You know all about that. If you look at it closely, the Old Testament is brimming with miracles. You've got Abraham and all of his activity. With Isaac and the ram appearing. You've got Joseph. The plagues in Egypt, the Exodus, the Red Sea opening, prophets, kings. And finally, in the hillside country of Judea. When the fullness of time had come. Omnipotence and deity fused itself with human frailty. And God became a man. Emmanuel. God with us in the flesh. How is that possible? If you study in Genesis, the law of creation was that everything seed was in itself Everything reproduced after its own kind. It's a law of creation. Even now, they're trying to create life. What a bunch of fools. They have created hybrid strains. I used to grow hybrid tea roses till I moved to a forest and they can't handle the, the various things in the forest. I can't make it all of the f fungi and all of the black spot and all of that. They don't make it. There's a reason they don't make it. Because they're a hybrid strain. The hybrid rose, the hybrid tea rose is the most beautiful roses in the world. They don't always have a fragrant fragrance, but the the, the beauty of it is just, it's, un, it's unbelievable. But the hybrid strain is grafted into the wild rose root structure. And that's what gives it its viability or its power to sustain life. But if you don't know how to trim them and care for them, they will lose the hybrid strain and they will return to the wild rose state. You can cross a donkey with a horse, but you'll get a mule, and it's sterile. There is a law of creation that everything breeds after its own kind. Everything has its seed within itself. How is it then that the Spirit of God could overshadow a young girl whose name was Mary, and she would conceive. How is that possible? Because it's the same species. Man is not animal kind. He is not fish kind. He is not fowl kind. He is God kind. He was made in the image and likeness of God. Clap your hands and let your voice out. Jesus, I worship you. That's why I'm here to say to you today that if you're a human being, you were made to house the spirit of a living God, not a mountain, not a box. God is inside of you. You ought to lift your head with pride. You ought to lift your voice with joy. Your feet ought to dance to the worship, to the praise of this Jesus. People, we are God kind. We are God kind. That's why it's even sinners can walk in here and they recognize the presence 
presence and the Spirit of God because they are spiritual creatures within. We were made in the image and the likeness of God. Nothing else can make such a boast. Nothing else can make such a boast. But we are God kind. That's why that virgin could conceive. Same species. That ought to set your feet to dancing. That ought to set your soul on fire because there's revelation in this house. There is revelation in this house. Mm. <laughs> Put a tail on that. God forbid people. We would become hearers of the word and not doers. All unbelief is a challenge to the integrity of God. What a marvelous revelation would come if we taught our people intelligently what it means to believe on the name as a sinner and in the name as a believer. Living in it, walking in it, whelmed in it. I remember in ABI, I went to Apostolic Bible Institute within a year after I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I didn't know the Bible. I was in the Evangelical Free Church. I was a Baptist when I was a little boy. I was involved with Campus Crusade, Youth for Christ. I was a counselor and all those things. But I didn't really know the Bible. I was absolutely staggered, overwhelmed with how you people knew the Bible. So I decided I would go off to Bible school. And I went. Sister Norris, when I got to her classes... In the second year, I thought she was a master teacher. I loved to hear her, her lecture. She had a PhD in psychology. She was brilliant. But she told how in the early days of Pentecost that they would worship around hot, pot-bellied, you know, hot, white hot stoves. And they would dance with their eyes closed and they would spin in circles and no one ever fell into it or got burned. I went to these classes and she taught this stuff, okay? Then she told how that one night some little sister in the church was waiting through the snow on her way to the church and some thug jumped out of the bushes and tried to rob her and she threw her hands in there and said, In Jesus' name! And he fell dead. I'm a brand new convert now. And I like these stories. And the police came and said, lady, what did you do to him? They couldn't find a mark on him. She said, I said, in Jesus' name. Then Brother Norris told how that they would march around that old building there on Grand Avenue and claim that building in Jesus' name like the Hebrew children did around the walls of Jericho. I'm a new convert. I'd go back to the room where I stayed in Bible school and I would get down and cry and pray and say, Jesus, I want to see that. I want to, I want to have that kind of power. I want to see those things. And so through the years, the school fought me because of I preached on the fivefold ministry. I preached the gifts of the spirit. I was involved with large crusades and a lot of people getting the Holy Ghost. And they fought me. Brother Norris included. He fought me. Forbid any student to come hear me preach. If they did, they were out of the school the same day. They had to pack their bags and they were gone. And I graduated as the honest student for the year. <laughs> but I was invited back 35 years or 36 years after I graduated to ABI to preach the graduation, to preach a, a revival before the graduation. So I went. The first night I was in the pulpit. I just laid down my Bible. Brother Grant introduced me. And I said, uh, let's just talk. And maybe say, let's just talk. And so I talked. I said, you know, when I came here, 
I didn't know the Bible. I said, um, but I went to Brother Norris's class and I, I told the story I just told you. I went to Sister Norris's classes and I told the stories that, that she had told about the man falling dead. And all those grandchildren had heard those stories. Eleanor knew those stories. Brother Grant knew those stories. They all knew those stories. And I knew they knew those stories. So when I got all finished telling the stories, I said, Now, if you don't like the way I am, blame S.G. and Jesse Norris. Because I got it from them. I believed it and went out and did it. That is the difference. It's not enough to come here and believe it. You've got to go out and do it. And you've got the power to do it. And I've been back there five times now and preached their graduation. And the Holy Ghost fell in one of those graduations. And eight people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The, the graduates threw the caps and gowns off like a football huddle. And one man fell out. It was like it was like a storm had gone through. I don't know what the unsaved relatives thought, but who really cares what they thought? Because eight people got the Holy Ghost. They had healing lines in the aisles of the graduation. And they've had me back, I think, five times. You know why? Because there's a hunger. We've got to get beyond the traditional. We've got to get beyond the traditional. You may be seated. But people are afraid of the gifts of the Spirit. People are afraid of the demonstration of the Spirit of God in power. Some little something goes wrong. Anything in the hands of man is subject to error and misuse. I want you to know I've heard some preaching that was totally unbiblical. And those preachers are still with us. They still got their license. That's scary. They preach things that aren't even in the book. So what if you have a new convert that comes in and gets the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And on the next, about two weeks later, on a Sunday night, the choir sings and he gets blessed. And he takes off running around the building. And about the second lap, he slips on the carpet back there and bangs his head against the wall and cuts a, a gash. Takes six sutures to fix it up. You don't throw out Acts 2.38 because the guy slipped on the carpet. You take him aside and say, hey, buddy, slow down on the corners and keep your eyes open. That's what you do. You'll hear this story all over, but it really happened in my area, not in my church. Thank God. But there was one. We had tongues and interpretation prophecies all the time. One night, there we had a great service, and there was tongues and interpretation. And the interpretation started out by saying, Things are bad, thus saith the Lord. So far, okay. Things are very bad. Okay. In fact, things are so bad, I can hardly make it myself. I'll tell you something. If God can hardly make it himself, this boy's headed for the tallest bridge and I'm jumping off. I'm getting out of here. If God, if it's, God can't handle it, I'm not going to do it. It's like, this is not in my notes at all. I don't know where this is going to go, okay? But anyway, I counsel, you'll like this. I counseled with some guy about a year ago, and he had problems that were just on and on. I mean, it went on and on. I never heard anything like it. Even a Philadelphia lawyer would resign. He would resign. He, he wouldn't even try to handle it. So I said to the guy when he got all done, I listened, didn't say anything. I said to him, I said, I want to ask you a question. Have you prayed about this? Oh, yes, Brother Stone King, I prayed. You really prayed? Yes. I said, did God hear you? Oh, yes, Brother Stone King, he heard me. I said, so you're telling me you have really prayed about this and you tell me that God has heard you. Oh, yes. I said, well, I have one thing to say. His eyes lit up. I said, if God can't help you, I'm not going to try. <laughs> Who am I? If God can't help you, I have no hope.
I've had preachers walk up to me and say, well, Brother Strong King, we watched you. You prayed for the people. They weren't healed. Why weren't they healed? I said, I don't know why they're not healed. I'm not God. He just said, lay hands on them and pray. So I lay hands on them and I pray. You know what our problem is? We major on the minuses. We need to major on the pluses. Forget what he didn't do. Let's shout and dance over what he did do. Forget the minuses. There are reasons. There are reasons why some people are not healed. For example, I was in this one meeting. It was a big meeting. And there was a guy in a wheelchair over here. Right in the, toward the end of my preaching, he jumped up out of the wheelchair. The gift of faith was in that place. He jumped out of the wheelchair and ran clear over here and began to jump up and down dance. And I ran over there and danced with him. The whole place was on its feet. I mean, it was like an explosion. It was incredible. All of a sudden, he just stopped dancing and ran back to the wheelchair. And I thought, what's that all about? And he sat down. So I went over there and sat down beside him. I said, what is it? He said, oh, Brother Stone King. I said, yes. He said, if they find out I'm healed, I will lose my government pension. I said, what? He said, if they find out I'm healed, I will lose my pension from the government. I'm not lying. They wheeled him out of there that night in a wheelchair. He'd rather be in a wheelchair collecting a check from the government than to be healed and get a job and work. So I don't beat myself up anymore. I don't. I used to beat myself up. It's only you need to get with you. You need to fast and pray. I don't do that anymore. There are reasons why people are healed. That's happened three times in my ministry. People have been miraculously healed, and they went back to the wheelchair because they had a they had a check coming. People forget the minuses. Forget the minuses. Major on the pluses. Rejoice in what God has done. Rejoice in what God has done. And if they're not healed the first time, pray the second time. If they're not healed the third time, pray the fourth time. Just keep laying hands on and keep praying in the name of Jesus. Because he is faithful. He promised. I believe in the power of the name of Jesus. I was in a meeting and some devil possessed guy walked in. I was on the platform, hadn't even been introduced. He came right down that center aisle. And I said, devil, you see that man you sent? You get him out of here or I will convert him. <laughs> that man stopped and stared at me and spun and ran out of there. That's the kind of power we have a hold of. The devil sent him to disrupt things. Billy Cole told me in India, when they went to India, all the devil possessed people, they would, they would, they would, when he would walk through the door, they'd all stand up being at the demonstrate. And when he would step out of the door, they'd settle down. He'd walk back to the door, to the auditorium, they'd all stand up and demonstrate. And he'd, he'd signal the, the, uh, the ushers, and he'd have them spot everyone that had stood up in, in resistance to him. They were devil possessed. And take them all out of the, all out of the audience and put them in a room and lock them in it till after the service was over that he'd go and help them. You know why he said that? He said, he said, Lee, he said, if they'd have been allowed to stay in there, those people all knew they are strange. They don't think about God, the power of God. It would have scared them. We'd have never got them. But by taking those people out, they prayed hundreds through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People, we've got to get the wisdom of God in all of this. We've got to get the wisdom of God and move in the spirit as the spirit leads us. The name of Jesus, say the name of Jesus, was in the hands of Paul what the rod was in the hands of Moses. Hmm. If the Egyptians could have stolen the rod, they would have stripped Moses of his weapon and power. If the Trinitarians and others of this world could strip us of his name, we will have lost his power. The modern church, having lost the power of the name of Jesus, is reduced to the position of a shorn Samson. The Gentile church is the people taken out of the world under the name of Jesus. 
if only Judaism had known the day of their visitation. The church, it's a supernatural body, clothed with supernatural power, gathered about a supernatural name. One mighty miracle today in the name of Jesus Christ is worth more than a thousand modernistic sermons that are being preached in many churches. This wonderful healing last night in the name of Jesus, that's worth more than a thousand modernistic sermons. To stand up for a moment. Wonderful. How do you feel today? Great. Great. No pain. No pain. No pain. <laughs> All because of a man called Jesus. All because of a name. A name that is above every name. <laughs> Hallelujah. There were many miracles here last night. There were many miracles here this weekend that you haven't even heard about yet. As far as I'm concerned, Jesus is the one name that challenges an adjective to qualify it. There is, there's nothing like his name. And there's a move on in this country to forbid chaplains, people in government, when they pray, to mention the name of Jesus. Jesus said, you'll be hated of all men for my name's sake, not my spirit's sake, but my name's sake. I never thought I'd live to see the day in America. Now they're forbidding the name of Jesus in public schools, but they can say Allah. Christian, you know the reason that evil takes over is because good people don't do anything about it. They don't speak out. As far as I'm concerned, Christian, you ought to come out of your corner. You ought to vote and write and speak out. Because we are a voice to be reckoned with. Because the name of Jesus is in us, upon us. And there is nothing out there that can fight it. They will not forbid me to say Jesus. I will say Jesus any time I decide to say Jesus. You're going to have to fight fire with fire. And if we pray, I mean pray, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We can bring them to their knees. We can bring them to their knees. Oh. I could tell you a lot of things that are going on that I shouldn't put on tape. It's unbelievable where we are right now. But I want to ask you a question. How do you fight a man who walks up to a tomb where his good friend Lazarus has been dead for four days You know why he didn't come until the fourth day? Because in Judaism, there was a law, they thought, that it was impossible to raise anyone from the dead after the third day because the body had begun to decompose. So, Jesus came on the fourth day. He has a way of just tearing your house down. And he stood there on the fourth day and said, Lazarus, come forth. It's a good thing he named him. If he'd have just said, come forth, the whole resurrection would have come marching out of there because he was and is the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And there's nothing that can fight it. There's nothing that can fight it. 
How do you fight a man who doesn't even bother to knock on the door? He comes to the wall <laughs> and sits down at your table and says, I've come to have lunch with you. <laughs> How do you fight that? You don't fight that because there's no way to fight that. How does this world fight us? They can't. There's no way to fight us. There's no way. There's no remedy. There's no recipe that can conquer us. Nothing. You don't seem as excited about that as I thought you would be. There's nothing. There's nothing that can fight us. There's nothing. We are the church. The gates of hell should not prevail against the church. The devil himself. You could have, whole, you could have the whole religious world standing in front of Lucifer. Commanding. They'll not move him. But just one of us, an apostolic, baptized in Jesus' name believer can stand in front of Lucifer himself and back him off. It will back him off because he has no choice. He has no choice. He has no choice. <laughs> I, I think I've told this before, but there are probably people here who haven't heard it. Brother T.D. B. Barnes, he was a prophet of God. And he was my dearest friend. I just, there's no one like him. I just love him. He's, I miss him. But one day, he called me on the phone. He said, boy, I had an unusual experience. I said, what's that? As if he didn't have had, never had an unusual experience, you know. I mean, he said, you know, he said, a witch in the city called me, a woman witch. And she said, are you T.W. Barnes? He said, yes, I am. She said, I'm coming to curse you. He said, come ahead. <laughs> That's the way he was. <laughs> she came. His office was small. And um, she walked in. And she, he, said, he said, she cursed the walls. She cursed the drapes, the couches. She cursed the pictures, everything. Cursed it all. And then she turned to me, he said... And she said, T.W. Barnes, I'm going to curse you that you'll not be able to sleep at night and you will die of exhaustion. He said, so she did her thing and she walked out. And he went back to his paperwork and talking to people on the phone. He said, but that night, he said, I woke up about two o'clock in the morning and I could feel the power of darkness in my bedroom. He said, I knew exactly what it was. He said, so I sat up on the side of my bed, put my feet on the floor and said, devil, come here. And he says, he has to come. Because this is greater than he is. This is greater. This is greater. He said, I could feel that demonic force come near to me. And he said, I said, devil, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to go back to the one who sent you to me and you do to her what she sent you to do to me. In Jesus' name, go! He said, that thing spun and just left my bedroom just like that. It was gone. He said, I went back to bed and went to sleep. He said, about two or three hours later, my phone rang. It was that witch. She said, Brother Barnes, get this thing off of me. Do something, but get this thing off of me. In other words, people, I don't care what comes to you. You can reverse the curse and send it back. And I've got a feeling there are some people here today 
You need to go after that thing and say, I send you back in the name of Jesus. If I'm talking to you, do it. Just do it. Oh, I repeat what the rod was in the hands of Moses. The name of Jesus is in the hands of the weakest child of God. It was not Moses that was great. It was the rod and the God of the rod. But the revelation is you have to let go of it. When Moses threw that rod down, when he stretched it out over the sea, in other words, the power of this rod that's in you, in the name of Jesus, you have to let go of it. You have to give it out. Mm. You may be seated. I could go on a long time, but but some couple of things have happened the last two years that have just set my soul on fire, and I hope at least there'll be some kind of a spark in you today. People, I told you, I preached to you, we're headed for some of the most unusual manifestations of God the world has ever known or ever seen. There are things beginning to happen that are absolutely electrifying. God is manifesting himself. <clears throat> Brother Rick Gonzalez in Chicago told me he does a jail service. I don't know they baptized. I don't know. I don't know how many, way over a hundred, I think, this year. And they're getting the Holy Ghost. He told me 4,200 just in jail services there in, in the Chicago area. He's got a hold of God. In fact, he took me downtown Chicago where people just don't go and showed me where he picks up the people that he wins to God. He's got X everything in his church. Murderers, robbers, you name it, they are there. They're there. In fact, the last time I was there on the Sunday morning, I watched a Mexican man and a black man who normally are gunning for each other in the streets in Chicago. But they both were baptized in Jesus' name. They both have the Holy Ghost. I watched them with their heads on each other's shoulders holding each other, sobbing, speaking with tongues. I stopped. I just stopped ministering and tears just ran down my face. And I said, Jesus, only you could do something like that. Only you. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Rick told me, in one of those services, <clears throat> he said, um, a Satanist, warlock, walked up to him in that particular prisoner jail where he was, and walked up to Rick and said to him, Who are you? And so Rick told him who he was. And this Satanist warlock said to Brother Gonzalez, he said, I have fought every religious group that's come into this prison, but I cannot fight you. Mm. 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 He's your convert. And then the saint, this warlock, admitted to Brother Rick Gonzalez. He said, you people have the power of the one true God. Yeah. 
So what I'm saying is this. If Satanist warlocks are making declarations like this, what should you and I be doing as children of God in this hour? be seated. But in your own way, for a moment, I want you just to shout out loud, I have the power of the one true God. And his name is Jesus. May be seated. I want you to lift your hands just for a moment before I tell you the final thing I feel to share or transmit. Pray that great understanding and revelation and total freedom will come to you in the next few moments. Just let your voice out. Lord Jesus, let total freedom and understanding come to us. I rebuke all fear and intimidation here among everyone, anyone, all that are here today, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I rebuke all fear in Jesus' name, intimidation in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. God, give us, O Lord, I pray today, the fire, the ammunition, to forever fight against and destroy the works of darkness. I ask you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to become bold in our apostolic Christianity. I have some friends, brother and sister Shepherd, Don Shepherd. They pastor a church in Southern California. Don and Melody were raised Jewish. They are converted to Christianity. They are powerful in the spirit. And they've been to Israel with me a number of times. And they speak some Hebrew. And they also reach out to Messianic Jews. But they're doing a good work in Southern California. Before they went to Southern California to that area now in San Diego, they were in the Los Angeles area. And uh, Melody is a preacher. And so she went to the jail, the jails there in uh, Los Angeles, and began to preach to the women in the uh, women's jail that they had there. And she said, she told me, she said, Brother Stone King, and she keeps me apprised of what's going on. I get information from them all the time. And she said, you know, I prayed some of those women through the Holy Ghost. Some of them were baptized in Jesus' name. She said, but in one of the services, she said, when I was conducting it and preaching, she said, when I stopped, she said there was a woman witch in that jail. And she'd heard about what I was doing, that witch. And so she came to that service and she walked up to Melody And she said, who are you? And so Melody told her, I'm an apostolic Christian. I'm here preaching to these inmates, whatever. And that woman witch looked at Melody and said, I have fought all groups and stopped them. But I cannot fight you. I've tried. I can't fight you. And Melody, for some reason, said, well, when you fight me, what do you see? And that that woman witch said, every time I fight you, all I see is blood. Because we are covered... By the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying here today? Every time the devil fights you, all he sees is blood. All he sees is blood. 
We need to plead the blood of Jesus Christ against the devil and the forces of darkness and bind it all in the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I feel like at the end of this conference, on in this service, I feel like we ought to get a hold of hands and just rejoice together. We've prayed, and we've prayed ourselves through. We've laid hands on each other, but I feel like 